The history of our equity journey really started um, in 1970 when we were sued by the Department of Justice for having um, a segregated school system. The color of your skin and your zip code um, in that era defined the quality of education that you received. We had many, many of our African-American families who had an educational system that really was subpar to other parts of the county. And quite frankly, nobody wants to admit that. It was shocking because the, the county is not large geographically, although you know we have 67,000 students, you can still drive from one end of the county to the other end in a half hour. What it forced us to do is look at every aspect of our educational system. And our commitment was we were going to show what the data said, good, bad, or ugly, we were going to show it because that was the only way for us to really start making those steps toward an equitable school system. The why for doing it is very, very simple. It's that student sitting in front of you. I was working at our district office and um, our superintendent, Dr. Griffin, came to me. He expressed that he was really interested in getting high school students involved in um, some authentic curriculum. He wanted to launch like a high school innovation program. We try to include a racial awareness into all the decisions that we make structurally because we can't be an equity program if we don't. So if we're changing this element of our school design or this element of our in instruction, what is the perception among all of our students? What is the, um, what is the effect it's going to have? Is there any chance that it could affect one group of students differently than another in a negative way? In our environment, we are really open with each other, and I think we have tough conversations with each other. That's like the culture of our team in general. We're really open with each other, and we're explicit about wanting to be equitable. If we're gonna have a, a school that asks hard questions, we might as well start those right in the interview. My favorite interview question we ask is, um, as a teacher, why do you believe there's an achievement gap between white and non-white students, and what does that mean to you instructionally and as a, as a professional? They asked me essentially why I think students of color achieve at a lower rate. And I said, I think there are a number of reasons and it can go really deep. If we really want to trace it, there are a number of historical oppressions that still have an influence on why students perform the way they perform today, and there's nothing innate about those students in particular, but that there are a lot of historical traumas, oppressions, things systemically that impact the system that they operate in, and they all agreed. <laughs> they were like, yes, we agree. Like, that's the, that's the consensus we have about those things, and because of that, um, we just operate with that in mind all the time. What's the subject of her speech? Like the thing the she's talking about. Amendment. One more time? The equal rights amendment. Yeah, the amendment, right? The whole speech is about the amendment. That's what she's talking about. We were reading a speech by Shirley Chisholm that she gave in 1970 on the floor of the US House of Representatives on the Equal Rights Amendment. And a lot of them really engaged with it well. I think they're responding to like seeing themselves in something. So whether it was like my students of color or my female students, which I remember as a student, anytime there was a text that I could actually see myself in, I was so excited. Because it means that number one, your instructor thinks that experience is valuable because they decided to include it. We can't blame them for not empathizing with people different from them if they never meet those people or if they never read about their experiences. But what is she suggesting here? She's saying we have this law that like makes sure women aren't overworked, but it's kind of also unfair to not do it to men too. Yeah, she's saying like a, an amendment on equal rights is not going to be good for just women, right? It's going to be good it's going to be beneficial for more, right? Because who is she? Who is she talking to? Um, the House of Representatives. People have biases. We all have them. But what's crucial is that you recognize when you have them. You just have to be like aware that you're having those biases. I think really that can only happen when the role models in the room are trying to make connections with diverse groups of people. We can't pretend that we live in a colorblind world because we don't. 
and all of our backgrounds like enrich the world in which we live, right? But we can all come together and say, let's talk about ways that we're all doing things that aren't like optimal. Like we're never gonna be perfect because we're people and a teacher or someone working in a school makes about a million decisions a day. All these small little micro decisions that add up and having like a network around you of teachers who buy into the same thing, who believe in the same mission, who all want to get better together, you can, like that's how you can create positive change. Mm -hmm.